I have a lot of co-investigators and collaborators, um, mentors, and funding from NIH um, and the VA, like I said, like thought it said. So my academic home is the Center for Innovations in Quality, Effectiveness, and Safety. This is a center of excellence for health services research um, that tries to improve, that aims to improve the health of patients across the nation by helping to ensure that patient-centered delivery of scientific discoveries. Um, within the COIN, the Center of Excellence, I'm also the site leader of the Mental Illness Research, Education, and Clinical Center in Houston. And the primary aim of the MIREC is to promote equity in engagement, access, and quality of mental health care for veterans facing barriers to care, especially rural veterans and to develop and implement pragmatic, integrated behavioral health interventions for patients with medical illnesses. So uh, an overview of this presentation, I kind of think of myself as interested in three broad areas. Um, behavioral medicine, or the role that distress plays in chronic medical conditions, or the way it exacerbates chronic medical conditions. Um, using novel delivery of treatments, so innovative ways to deliver interventions that can actually be accessible uh, to patients. And my particular treatment modality is acceptance and commitment therapy. So I will be telling you um, quite a bit about ACT just because it's like my little love. Um, I'll be sharing with you some research studies, clinical trials of patients with migraine and depression, vascular disease and depression or anxiety, patients undergoing orthopedic surgery, um, and inflammatory bowel disease. And I'll just go over those results briefly with you. So why is it important to target distress in medical populations? So depression and anxiety, and I kind of lump those as distress-based conditions, are highly prevalent in patients with chronic medical conditions. Approximately, by, by 2030, it's estimated that 30 million Americans will be living with chronic medical conditions, and actually 30% approximately of those patients will have a co-occurring psychiatric condition, um, like depression or anxiety. Depression and anxiety lead to worse outcomes, so worse prognosis, worse quality of life, life poor functioning, um, and an exacerbation of the medical condition and harder to treat medical condition. Um, also, adherence to the medical condition is even more difficult when there's co-occurring depression or anxiety. So for example, if a person has depression, they are three times less likely to adhere to medical recommendations compared to those without depression. So treatment adherence really drops when there's depression or anxiety. The economic burden of a medical problem is two to, ti two to four times higher when there's depression or anxiety. The, the statistics on co-occurring depression or anxiety in really any chronic medical condition is quite, a bit, you know, quite abysmal, and yet depression and anxiety are undertreated and underdiagnosed in chronic medical conditions. This is partially due to poor recognition and also partially you know, because of physicians in primary care or in specialty care settings focusing on the disease state rather than on the co-occurrence of any distress. We also know that behavioral interventions in medicine have, sorry, behavioral interventions in medicine have a long history of success. So for example, cognitive behavioral therapy um, is found to be effective for treatment of chronic pain, of migraine, of diabetes, of inflammatory bowel disease, not inflammatory bowel disease, um, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and we know that psychotherapies are very effective in the treatment of depression, anxiety, and other psychiatric conditions. This long history of success has also re uh, revealed really important areas of growth or gaps in the efficacy of these treatments. For example, we know that we need novel treatment delivery um, methods to increase access and adherence to, to interventions, right? So these gold standard trials that the National Institutes of Health have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in 
have not translated into care in the community, uh, mainly because people don't go to 12 to 15 sessions in the community, right? So even though you might find that this intervention is effective in a gold standard efficacy randomized controlled trial, they're not what's it's not what's happening on the ground in communities in medical settings. We also need to address the ever-growing population of patients with comorbidity. So that's another problem with randomized controlled trials. A lot of the randomized controlled trials specifically exclude patients with comorbidity, right? Where unfortunately that's increasingly the typical patient that we see, the one with comorbidity. So we have to address that issue. And then importantly, I think more and more we're recognizing the importance of understanding what are the proposed mechanisms of change, right? So over the past 20 years or so, we look at CBT as a package. Does it work? Does it not work? But we don't really understand why it works or how it works. And I think to increasingly refine treatments and improve upon treatments, we need a better understanding of which aspects of the treatments work and why it works so that we can refine the treatment more and more. So these issues led me to develop a one-day group workshop. Um, so it's a one-day, six-hour group workshop for patients. And first I'm going to tell you why I decided on this one-day group workshop. So if a patient comes in once, right, it, they're there once. They don't have to come back repeatedly out week after week. And this is based on the research literature, meta-analyses after meta-analyses showing that the average number of therapy sessions that patients actually go to is approximately four. So not nearly like the 12 to 15 sessions that gold standard trials have. The modal number of therapy sessions is one. I mean, that's a shocking statistic to me, right? So most patients will go to one session and not come back. And dose effect studies show that the most change in therapy happens early on, within the first eight sessions. So I thought, okay, if we bring them in once, we've got the modal number of sessions. If we do six hours, they have more than the typical average number of sessions that they might get. And we're trying to like, in, you know, put as much as we can into that six hour workshop as we can. In addition to increasing adherence and completion, it also is more suitable for patients presenting, not presenting for psychiatric care. So for those of you who work in any specialty clinic or primary care setting, there's a lot of stigma around mental health care. So we don't present this workshop as therapy. We present it as a workshop to enhance coping, quality of life, functioning, to help with coping strategies for the medical condition. So that decreases the stigma associated with going to a mental health provider or to a mental health clinic. So this one-day workshop is less stigmatizing and threatening and actually is more easily implemented in primary care or specialty care settings. So a lot of specialty care settings have educational workshops where they educate patients about the illness itself. So adding this kind of coping uh, skills workshop is not that foreign of a concept for specialty clinics. It's also more accessible and feasible for rural patients and functionally impaired patients. So in the US at least, one fourth of patients live in rural areas. Asking patients to come for treatment once is very different than asking them to come week after week for 12 to 15 weeks in a row. And of course, you always have to pay attention to funding mechanisms and NIH has now these new buzzwords about deployment-focused interventions, research, pragmatic clinical trials, and this is based on the fact that what they have found after decades of research is that a lot of these gold standard interventions are not being implemented actually in clinics or in medical settings. So now they're increasingly focused on pragmatic trials, which means they can practically be implemented in treatment settings. 
um, or they can be deployed into treatment settings. So thinking about comorbidity, for example, you know, you have patients with a comorbid medical and psychiatric condition. If we're going to implement a psychological intervention, what is it that we would actually be targeting or treating? And I would argue that what I target is the coping strategies. Because the way that a person copes with medical conditions and distress, such as depression or anxiety, has long-term effects. And I'm going to give you examples of this. But we know, the research literature has shown that patients who are preoccupied with avoiding pain, distress, anxiety, even facing the medical condition they have, have poor psychological and health outcomes than those who are willing to kind of face the, the experience that they're having or the psychological condition that they're having. So here's an example from anxiety. I, I'm going to give you an example from a mental health and then a very physical condition. So anxiety. You feel anxious, right? And we can, you can add anything into that drink piece, right? You feel anxious, you drink, or you sleep, or you watch TV, any avoidance strategy, if you like. Well, it works really well, right? You drink, you feel less anxious in the short run. The problem is that the next day the anxiety is back. Right? And so you drink a little bit more. And for the short run, it's, it's lowered. Right? So this avoidance loop, I think what's really important, and particularly working with our patients, is to kind of show them how avoidance strategies really work in the short run to validate that experience and to show them how actually in the long run it actually doesn't work and often exacerbates the problem. That the same thing can be applied, for example, to chronic pain. We feel pain, a chronic pain condition. You could take a narcotic or your friends tell you, hey, let's go out. And you say, no, I can't go out. I'm in too much pain. Well, this works really well in the short term, right? And our opiates work well in the short term. And so that's what's reinforcing to the patient, that it works well in the short term. The problem is that the next day the pain is back, right? You take a little bit more of the medication, you avoid more activity, and again, short term it works. The problem is that in the long term, it doesn't work very well. So this is the transdiagnostic piece that I'm, I'm talking about and I'll talk more about in a second. So the trick with avoidance is that if we don't want to feel any internal negative state, be it pain, anxiety, guilt, sadness, vulnerability, we avoid it. And we do so because it works really well in the short term. It's reinforcing. Unfortunately, it doesn't solve the problem. The problem comes back stronger, and we start to avoid more and more things. And we also become hypersensitive to the things that trouble us. And we're not living life, right? That's another consequence, of course, that we're making the fear of anxiety or pain or some internal negative state stronger than what matters most to us, which actually also leads to a sense of depression. So acceptance and commitment therapy is an intervention that targets specifically avoidance. Not just avoidance of external things that we don't like, but internal things. So ACT is an empirically supported behavior therapy. It is listed by the APA as an empirically supported treatment for anxiety, for depression, for OCD, for chronic pain, and for psychosis. And it is transdiagnostic. So you learn the model of ACT, and the processes that you learn are applicable to any condition. It's not like you learn ACT for depression, ACT for anxiety, ACT for chronic pain. The, the processes are applicable across different conditions, and in fact, to just living. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And for me, what I was drawn to in ACT is that it starts from a very different fundamental premise. It starts from the premise that pain, grief, disappointment, illness, anxiety are inevitable features of human life. We are all going to face something like this in our lifetime. And the goal of ACT is to help individuals adapt to these types of challenges, right? And so I like this model a little bit more than other 
models that start with the fact, with, with kind of the idea that these are disease states and you have to remove the disease state. It's more like, okay, life can be hard and when it gets tough, how do we adapt to these challenges? And so how do we adapt to these challenges? So ACT teaches a combination of acceptance and mindfulness strategies with behavior change strategies. So this is particularly useful, I think, for medical conditions that we often cannot change, right? A lot of medical, chronic medical conditions, we cannot change. And in fact, struggling or fighting with the condition makes it worse. And so I like the dose of acceptance that ACT you know, teaches with behavior change. So there's a very strong activation um, aspect of ACT. So acceptance is promoted in the areas that can't be directly changed. So private experiences, internal experiences like thoughts, emotions, bodily sensations, pain, those are things that are difficult to change because they're internal to us. So I'll give you an example. I come in here, I have the thought, oh my God, this is really stressful. What are these people going to think of me? This is really going to be, you know, I, I'm going to disappoint. My heart starts racing. If I could change those thoughts, I would have eight years ago. <laughs> and I've been working on this for a long time. And I can't. I mean, that thought is going to pop up. My heart racing, it's going to happen. My throat restricting, it's going to happen. I can fight that. Like, I can say, oh my God, why am I like this after eight years or 10 years of giving talks? Like, that's ridiculous. What's wrong with me? I'm so pathetic. Why is it like this? What do you think would happen to me if I responded to my thoughts and emotions this way? What are your thoughts? It gets worse. It gets worse, exactly. Like, struggling with my internal states actually makes it worse. If instead I notice my thoughts and I notice, you know, my heart racing and I say, it's okay, it's all right, just continue focusing on what matters and doing what matters to you, what do you think would happen? It might go down, but it might not, right? At least I haven't exacerbated it, right? So the idea is, and there's a very large literature, a thought and emotion suppression literature that Wegner has been you know, spearheading now for a long time, showing that the more you try to distract and suppress thoughts, it works well in the short term. Like you can all tell me examples of distracting from thoughts you don't like or the positive thinking movement that works really well. I can tell myself I'm awesome, that I'm great. And it works really well in the short term. What Wegner and others have found is that in the long term, you actually have those thoughts worse. They're louder, they're more, they interfere more in your functioning. And so this idea of accepting internal states is based on a very large literature showing that in the long run, distraction, suppression doesn't work very well. And then engagement in activities that have been avoided. So the basic principles of ACT are that we get to choose our actions, where we go, what we do with our hands and feet, and what comes out of our mouth. I get to choose how I behave. I have relatively little choice about the pop, about the thoughts that might pop up or the emotions that might show up in the moment. And so the idea is that the most effective way to change our lives is to focus on changing our actions and learning new ways to deal with our thoughts, emotions, and memories. And so you, we get a lot of patients that come in and that say, I will do X when I'm not anxious, or I will do X when I'm no longer depressed, or I will go out when I don't have pain. And the idea here is that actually you don't have to wait to feel better before doing something. In fact, you can do something you don't want to do because doing it is important. So this is the part that's very key in ACT, clarifying what's important and what matters to you. So even though it makes me anxious to give talks, I give talks. And I do this because it matters to me. 
right? I, give, I do these one-day ACT workshops. It's very anxiety-provoking for me, but I do it because it, it matters to me. Can you all think of something you do that you don't want to do because doing it is important? Who wakes up at 2 a.m. with a child? Doesn't feel good. You don't want to do it. Nothing feels good about that. You do it because it matters, right? It matters to the kind of person you want to be. And you cannot do something you want to do because not doing it is important. This is an important piece, actually, because it's not punishment-based. It's moving towards something that matters rather than avoiding something that you don't want to happen. It might seem like a minor discrepancy, but it's an important one. So there are three processes, actually six processes, processes in ACT, and I hope you'll bear with me as I talk to you a little bit more about ACT because I think it's important. And they can be divided into being learning how to be more open to our emotions, being more mindful and aware of the present moment, and doing what matters. So the opening up in ACT, so there are six processes in ACT. The two about opening up are acceptance and diffusion. So the idea of acceptance is that you can learn to have internal emotions and not be so afraid of them, okay? So for example, any of you been on a roller coaster? How many of you are like this on a roller coaster? Raise your hand. And how many of you are like this? Raise your hand. Is it the same ride? It's the same ride, right? Um, another silly example, but like imagine we go outside and it's pouring, right? It's pouring outside and you don't have an umbrella. How are you going to walk to your car? Who's going to be swearing as they're walking to their car? <laughs> Raise. And how many of you are just going to walk and say, well, I don't like this, but oh well. And who's suffering more, right? It, the situation is the same. It's a silly example. But the idea is that the situation is the same. We can add suffering to a situation or keep it as it is. And children are amazing at this. Children are oblivious to kind of the suffering of our minds. And then slowly, they learn that our, our minds start taking over and we start to suffer with language, OK? Then the, there's a cognitive piece, and for those of you who know traditional cognitive behavior therapy, ACT treats thoughts quite differently than the traditional CBT does. In traditional CBT, you might have a thought, like I might have a thought that I'm not good enough to give this talk, and I could spend all day and for probably the rest of the, my life giving the evidence for this thought, giving the evidence against the thought, and I'll still actually have the thought, right? So unlike traditional CBT, what ACT does is try to help people develop a little bit of distance from the thought. Recognize that, so when you're fused with a thought, you treat thoughts like they're reality, the truth, important, like it's an order, right? So you recognize that you're cognitively fused with something if you have rules, if you have reasons, judgments, if you're finding yourself ruminating about the past or worrying about the future all the time. Or if you have self kind of stories about yourself. So these are kind of clues that you're being cognitively fused. And when you're defused, it's when you can recognize I'm having the thought. So for example, just bear with me a second and just say, for example, I'm not good enough. Can you do it? I'm not good enough. Who's had that thought before? Very common, like everyone, right? I'm, I, I'm not good enough. A very simple cognitive defusion task or, or exercise is to say, OK, I'm having the thought that I'm not good enough. Can you try that now? So you're just like stepping back a little bit from it. You're not trying to change it. You're not trying to say, no, I'm really great. I'm really amazing. I'm really fine. It's just stepping back and saying, OK, this is a thought that always hooks me. It's one of my storylines. I can notice that, right? So you don't, unlike traditional CBT, we're not trying to change the content of a thought. We're trying to change the way we relate to a thought. 
that thoughts don't like grab us and hook us in the same way. It's like a bad news radio station that's always there in the background. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the second, the, the second kind of half of ACT is being centered and learning new perspectives. So one of the things I would ask you to think about or that I would ask a patient about is how much do you find yourself thinking about the past or the future, right? I mean, how many of you, for, I'll give you an example from my life, right? I, was, I, I read a story to my son every night, and he actually asks for the same story every night. And after about two weeks of reading the exact same story to my child, I realized I didn't know what the story was about, right? That's mindless, right? I'm just on automatic pilot, reading the words, and not really present, because I was busy ruminating about like what had gone on during the day or thinking about what I'm going to do next. And what the problem is, is that you can only have the moment. It's not like I got anything done and I lost the moment with my child, right? So there's, there's a loss of vitality when you're not in the present moment. And so there's this encouragement of being more present in your life because it encourages vitality. Right? So now when I'm at work and I notice that I'm thinking about my son, I say, come back, come back. And when I'm with my son I say, and I'm thinking about work, I say, come back, be here. Right? And the other thing that's important, particularly with patients with chronic medical conditions, is developing perspective. One of the things that happens when patients have a chronic, chronic medical conditions is their lives really narrow. They really narrow in on their chronic medical condition. It becomes a lot about the chronic medical condition. And one of the things we try to do in ACT is expand that, reopen kind of the perspective to like, what else is there in your life? You've been focused on the medical condition for a long time now. How can we expand back? How can we open back up? And so some of the questions that we might ask is, think of a current situation you're struggling with. How would another pos person possibly see this? How would a younger or older version of you see this? How would a version of you who isn't struggling anymore with this see it? And I'm going quickly, right? But it's not quite as quick. But it helps people step back and ask, well, is there another way? Is there another way that I can approach the same situation? And then I think the heart of ACT is this. It's the motivational piece. It's doing what matters, right? Clarify what matters and then do what matters. And so values is the really new piece that ACT has brought, I think, to the psychotherapy literature. There's a big focus on asking what really matters to you? What is most important to you? What sorts of relationships do you want to build with others and with yourself, right? So there are different exercises we do, like to help people clarify what matters. Sometimes asking, what do I value in others can be, val can be useful. Um, and then I'm going to ask you guys to just think about the next exercise with me, if you're willing. Willing? Just raise your hand if you're willing. I don't want you to do anything you're not willing. Okay. So this exercise I give everyone in the workshop, and I think it's been valuable. So I want you to imagine you're 80 years old, and you've continued to live your life exactly as you do now. Okay? You don't change anything. You continue on the same path as you are. And I want you to fill in the blanks. I spent too much time worrying about I spent too little time doing things such as, and if I could go back in time, what I would do differently from today onward is. Was that easy to do or difficult? It is shockingly easy to do, and you know, what I've noticed is that not, that I wouldn't change big things. Like, I'm not going to change my job necessarily, or I'm not going to change kind of my big day-to-day -day activities, but maybe being more present, potentially, like little things, like being more present, or when I am in different situations, like how do I want to be as a human being with my colleagues? Like, 
when I'm in a meeting and I think about like, you know, I'm getting annoyed with someone, I pause and I say like, how do I want to be as a human being right now, right? Past requesting and past reaction. Yeah, I mean, there's also this beautiful um, a palliative care nurse in England who worked for 20 years with the dying, wrote down the things that they said, you know, on their dying days. And she wrote this uh, book, The Top 10 Regrets of the Dying, and it was, you know, different um, articles were written about it. And it's the same things, like I worried too much, I didn't let myself be happy, I didn't, let, I didn't stay in touch with people I cared about, I was afraid to let myself, you know, I mean, they're the classic things. Um, and I tell my patients, you know, start now. Like start, you know, it doesn't have to be huge things, but it could be small things, like small things that might give you a sense. And I don't look for happiness. It's not like I want my patients to be happy. I want them to feel vitalized. And sometimes that's hard, right? Or to do what matters. And sometimes that's hard and not necessarily happy. We are languaging human beings, yeah. right? Our minds never turn off. Like you have meditators that can do it for a few minutes at a time, right? But it's not, we are languaging human beings. It's like if I think, oh, that's good, well, I have to know bad. And so that automatically pops up. If you tell me you're great, I think, well, what if I'm not great? What if I'm bad? I mean, we are, our minds are always on. We can't shut them off. I think that the best thing we can do, I mean, my opinion, is that keep our values in mind and then behave in ways that are consistent with what matters to us and try to be more present. And it's not like I can be present in my life all the time, right? But when I'm noticing that I'm not present, I gently bring myself back. When I'm noticing and you know, I'm putting my son to bed and I notice my mind has drifted, I gently bring myself back. I don't put myself, well, I do a little bit, but I try not to put myself down. I try to say, just come back, come back over and over. I mean, that's what meditation is. That's what mindfulness is. Um, and so, you know, we talk about values as being like your northern star or like something that guides us. When you're struggling on what decision to make, use your values to guide you and how you want to behave in the moment. And then the part of ACT that's the committed action part is very classic behavioral activation. Okay, you can talk about what matters until the end of time, but it, you have to show it in your behavior. If I say I value my child, I have to show it in my behavior. If I say I value my colleagues, I have to show it in my behavior and how I treat my colleagues, right? So it's what behaviors do you engage in to show that these things matter to you? So briefly, um, like I already said, ACT is an empirically supported treatment for depression, anxiety, chronic pain, psychosis, and OCD. And SAMHSA has listed um, ACT on the National Regist Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practice. So this RCT was from 2014. Um, and I just want to show you, you know, in 1999, that's where the explosion happened for RCTs because that's when the textbook the first ACT textbook came out in 1999. So as of 2014, there were over 100 clinical trials. This summer when I did a lit review, there were over 200 randomized clinical trials of ACT. And I don't want you necessarily to like read this whole thing, but I want to show you that on this table, these are all like mental health conditions, depression, anxiety, social phobia, GAD. So it's been tested in all these mental health conditions. It's been tested, this is 2014, there are a lot more now. These are medical conditions like chronic pain, epilepsy, diabetes, um, post-surgical pain, HIV prevention. And then look, random things like chest performance, worksite stress, stigma and burnout racial prejudice, right? So the idea is that act, you're taught skills that are applicable to any domain of living. It's not a disease-focused intervention. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you about my work in particular. Um, so the research I'm gonna be talking to you about are my studies on one-day ACT workshops. And in all my studies that I'll be talking about, Comorbidity is the focus rather than the exclusion. So when I first started doing a literature search, I was studying migraine, 
and I was looking for studies on migraine and depression, and they almost always excluded patients with depression. They didn't want the messiness of a mental health condition. Or if they let them be, it wasn't a focus at all. So all the interventions are about 9.30 to 3.30 on a Saturday. We usually have about six to 10 participants of all ages. And we usually do about five hours of ACT and one hour of illness management. So one of the things that we have learned is that patients with chronic medical conditions do not know a lot about their chronic medical condition. For example, with migraine, a very simple thing, patients didn't know the difference between a preventive and acute medication. They, they didn't know, a, a lot of them didn't know, even though these are patients that had over eight migraines a month, which, which means like really, if you follow guidelines, at least they should have heard about preventives. So in each case, in each kind of chronic medical condition that we focused on, we, we develop manuals, educational manuals and ACT manuals. So why did I target, the first group that I targeted was migraine and depression. And just briefly, depression is about three to five times more common in migraine patients than in the general population. And longitudinal studies show us that actually it's a bi-directional effect. So patients who have migraine are at higher risk for, for developing depression and vice versa. Patients with depression are at higher risk for developing migraine. And this comorbidity leads to decreased quality of life, worse prognosis, increased risk for suicidality, medication overuse, and disability. When I started this study, there were no published controlled randomized trials targeting depression specifically in migraine. So I decided to pilot this one-day ACT workshop. It was a one-day ACT workshop compared to treatment as usual. Um, and our primary outcomes were depression, functioning, migraine-related disability, and headache. We had a two-step screening where first we screened for people. We wanted people kind of who had enough migraines but not chronic migraines at this point. So four to two migraines in the previous month. They screened positive on the ID migraine, which is a you know, well-validated screener for migraine, and had a PHQ-8 score, score of 10 or higher. If they screened positive, then we did a more substantial intake assessment with the SCID, the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression, the HUDAS, the Headache Disability Inventory, and then these process measures of ACT, the Chronic Pain Acceptance Questionnaire and the Chronic Pain Values Inventory. So this is a consort diagram. Um, we randomized two to one, 38 to 22, the ACT versus treatment as usual or wait list group. It was mainly female, which is consistent with the demographics of patients with migraine and depression, mainly white. I was in Iowa. This, was not, this would not be the case in Houston. <laughs> um, these are patients who had approximately eight migraines per month. Most had a previous history of depression. Most were taking acute migraine medications, only a third were taking preventives, and a third were on an antidepressant. Yes. So this was the pilot study. We've since followed up on it, but this is kind of the, the initial finding on the SCID. In the ACT condition, 29 out of 38 no longer met criteria for depression, whereas two out of the 21 no longer met criteria for depression. On the Hamilton rating scale for depression, you'll see the red line um, is the ACT group and the yellow line is the treatment as usual group. Our ACT group showed substantial improvements on depressive symptoms compared to treatment as usual. On the headache disability inventory, same thing. We found significant uh, condition by time interaction effect where ACT showed significantly less disability than treatment as usual. I was working very closely with a neurologist at the time, and she wanted them to fill out headache diaries. So every day at night, they would fill out whether they had a headache, how severe it was, if they took any medications, and how much disability. And what we found, and these are published, is that headache frequency and severity went down after the one-day ACT workshop, medication use went down, 
and actually visit to the healthcare provider went down. So one of the things about patients with migraines is often they end up in the ER because of the pain. And what we found is our group had less visits to the ER than, than the patients in the treatment as usual group. We also looked at the role of pain acceptance and values-based behavior, these are processes in ACT, on depression and disability. This is a little bit hard to follow, but I, I just want to show you that the patients who were depressed had much lower levels of pain acceptance and values-based behavior than those who were non-depressed. So kind of indicating, it wasn't a pure mediation analysis at this point, we were just looking at kind of descriptively, and we found that pain acceptance actually was different among the depressed and non-depressed group. So then I wanted to look at disability, right? And we did a regression analysis. We entered, I wanted to see whether depression would explain disability, right? Yes, depression explained disability. So people who were depressed exhibited more disability than those who were non-depressed. But what was amazing to me is acceptance predicted 20% of the variance above and beyond depression. For me, this is an amazing result. Like, not only is the depression leading to disability, but non-acceptance per se is also leading to disability. So that's the migraine study. We did follow it up um, with a much larger trial comparing ACT to illness management alone. And we found that Similar results, ACT did better, but illness management did pretty well. It didn't do as well as ACT, but interestingly, illness management plus support also resulted in some improvement, right? So then we did a study with vascular disease risk and depression and anxiety, and we also, kind of the rationale for this is that patients with depression and anxiety are at significantly greater risk of stroke, heart attack, and vascular mortality. And this has been a really underappreciated risk factor. Up until about 2014, though, in 2014, the American Heart Association and other health organizations listed depression as a significant risk, risk factor for acute coronary syndrome. So, I'll skip this. So we did a randomized clinical trial for patients who are at risk for cardiovascular disease by having high cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, and depression or anxiety, and the same kinds of goals to see whether this one-day ACT intervention would have an impact on outcomes. Very similar two-step screening. Um, we looked for people who had a score of 10 or higher on the PHQ-8 or on the GAD-7, and then we did the Hamilton rating scale for anxiety, Hamilton rating scale for depression, and then the World Health Organization disability assessment schedule and quality of life. We did follow-up measures on these. So this is our consort diagram again, but to make a long story short, 26 attended the workshop, 14 attended or treatment as usual. These are again the pilot study that led to, you know, larger studies. And what we found is that the ACT group, 77% of those in the ACT group compared to 21% in treatment as usual, recovered from depression, defined as a dropper 50% or more on the Hamilton rating scale for depression. 65% in the ACT group compared to 7% in the Tau group had recovered from anxiety. And here we were able to do a formal mediation analysis and we did find that people who showed specific improvements in the ACT-related processes, becoming more psychologically flexible, were the ones who showed greater improvements in depressive symptoms. So one more study I'll report on pretty quickly. So this was a study um, in orthopedic surgery. Um, one of the things, there are many studies showing that patients who are depressed or anxious prior to certain surgeries, one of them being orthopedic surgery, like total knee or total hip replacement, if you're depressed or anxious prior to surgery, you're at higher risk for developing chronic pain and opioid dependence post-surgery. And this is a pretty common finding in the surgical literature. And so we wanted to do, we, we had the question, okay, well, what if we treat these patients? 
those that are depressed, those are, that are anxious prior to surgery, then can we prevent the development of chronic pain and opioid dependence post-surgery? So it was a prevention trial, really. We're trying to see if we can stop people from moving from acute pain to chronic pain. So this is the model. We find people who are at risk, we give them ACT, and then we see whether we have lower pain and opioid use. So the outcomes were pain intensity and pain meds, and we also did qualitative interviews to see what they thought of the whole thing. You don't want to see this. Um, so just briefly, the patients who actually did ACT stopped using their opioids sooner than those that did not do ACT. And what was very interesting about this finding is that patients who had higher acceptance, higher values-based behavior, were the ones actually that stopped their opioids sooner and actually had less pain at follow-up, right? So the mechanisms that we are targeting are actually ones that are worth targeting, right? We also found that patients who had surgical complications did not do as well. So that taught us that, well, maybe one day is not enough for patients who end up with surgical complications. Okay, so then we did it with, I mean, I think the point here is that we've done this now with many different chronic medical conditions with very similar outcomes, right? We target depression, we target anxiety, we teach them a little bit about the illness, and they do significantly better, okay? I mean, the same thing happened with our inflammatory bowel disease. So in IBD, the, the meta-analysis have shown that no psychological interventions are actually very effective. <clears throat> so we tried this with an IBD population and it actually led to improvement in disease state, quality of life, and anxiety. So in general, I would say that it's you know this one-day workshop is fe feasible, credible, acceptable, and possibly efficacious. Um, I think a very key piece that I have not mentioned at all yet is that we're recruiting people that may otherwise not get help. I would say at least 80% of the patients that we recruited told us they would not have sought out any mental health treatment. We're recruiting all these patients from specialty clinics or primary care clinics or ortho clinics, and they unanimously said they would not have gone to seek help for their depression or anxiety, certainly would not have gone to therapy on a weekly basis. So I really value that we're helping people that might have or probably would have fallen through the cracks. Uh, treatment completion is 100%. We've never had any person leave the group, ever. And in fact, our follow-up rates are over 95%. So people feel committed to this. And we have amazing qualitative feedback, actually. People say they like the fire hose method. I've actually had more than one person use that term. Um, anyways. Um, or people say they really like the honesty of it, you know, like you're pulling off the band-aid, you're not just trying to make me feel better in the moment. Um, and they're empowered by this focus on values and the idea of acceptance. And so we have follow-up. Thought it is telling me to stop, so I'm going to stop. Okay. There. <laughs> Sorry. Well, if, if you look at that meta-analysis that I showed you from 2014, it's applied in healthy samples that people that want to improve their chest performance or people that want to Im improve their sports abilities or people, you know, it is, it has been used in healthy populations or patient, or actually it's been used in therapy burnout, right, to improve therapist burnout. So it has been used in healthy populations with kind of an interest in kind of improving kind of something, right? Um, so, so yeah, I think, I mean, I think the literature is there showing that it works in other areas. I've always wanted to do it as a gen, like, you know, in a general population kind of format. And there are people that do that, like in New Zealand, it's being rolled out in all these different community settings. I don't know that it's being empirically studied, right? Like I know there are lots of ACT people that do it in the community. I don't think it's in a 
research setting. It would be hard to get funding to test this, like, oh, I'm going to do this in a healthy population to improve what? You know, improve quality of life? You know, I don't know. But it would be very hard to get funding for that, I think. I think it's improved my, I mean, <laughs> it's improved my quality of life, so therefore it works. <laughs>